tonight's issue is uh, disappearing wetlands and um, a vanishing culture that comes out of an experience that Doug Boz, my colleague, a friend, and fellow student once upon a time in, in the West, um, did back in 1973 and 74. We'll tell you more about how we got to Acadiana. Uh, Doug is a photographer along with me. We both graduated from the Institute of Design, the IIT, back in the uh, seven, 1970, I think it was. And um, we have both maintained our careers as photographers through all these years. Doug is the founding uh, person of the Bard College photography program. And likewise, I have founded this program some 33 years ago and been a chairman. At the time, we were both teaching at Columbia College in Chicago, and we were part and parcel of the building of what became a major program there. Uh, and it's still very important today. Um, with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Doug um, and let him introduce our other speaker, Kristen Barak. Doug? Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, the third and very important part of this discussion uh, is Tristan Barak, uh, who is an environmental reporter for the Times Picayune, uh, a New Orleans advocate newspaper chain in Louisiana. And he covers climate change, pollution, marine fisheries, and Louisiana's efforts to restore its disappearing wetlands. Um, he was also recently part of a team that won national awards for an investigative series about industrial pollution in historically black communities along the Mississippi River. We actually, uh, uh, we found Tristan uh, by chance once this idea of connecting the work that we did to the incessant storms that happened this season. Uh, and we were doing a little research and I came across an article in the New York Times. It was a February 2018 collaboration between two environmental reporters from the New York Times and two from the, uh, from the Times-Picayune. And uh, Tristan was one of those people and he agreed to provide us with the, the facts and, the, and some of the science behind the wetlands disappearance. And a little later, we'll uh, be also be showing you, a, you know, more of a sample of our work um, and particularly how some of the pictures relate to this subject. And with that... Uh, with that, we're gonna share our screen, uh, take you through a keynote um, slide presentation and video. Um, the area in this picture is one we took back in 1974 from a helicopter as we flew over an area of the Mississippi, well actually down here I think around Morgan City down in this area uh, south. This map is a map of Acadiana. And some of you in the audience may not know exactly what Acadiana is, but it is the region of Southwest Louisiana, west of New Orleans, where Cajuns, what became Cajuns, uh, settled uh, after the diaspora that occurred in the 18th century at the end of the French and Indian War. Uh, the British abruptly threw out a lot of French speaking people in the northern uh, coastal provinces of Quebec and um, put them on boats, broke up families and what have you. And after traveling to a number of places and some went back to France, some went to the Caribbean, some went all the way into Asia, but a large majority went, ended up in Louisiana and New Orleans where they again were sort of uh, hostily, let's say, and, and John Lawrence was here and the historian of Louisiana can tell us more, uh, thrown, if you will, or forced into 
the marsh and wetlands of Louisiana, which is all this area here that Tristan's going to talk about. And they, everybody, they, the Creole and the established culture of New Orleans sort of thought that was useless land, so let them have it. Turned out it was full of bounty, full of fish, full of hunting, trapping, all kinds of things, which the Cajun culture built its, built its commerce and its, its culture upon. Um, and it is a very rich and un, unimaginable landscape if you've never been in it. Uh, and the amazing thing about this period in 1973 when we went down for a few days, uh, Escape Chicago Hold, where we were teaching, and discovered Page in Louisiana, is that it is a remarkable and different landscape than anything Doug and I had ever experienced, and I think maybe some of us later years have experienced it. But it is a landscape that depends upon water. It depends upon life upon water, upon the <laughs> upon water. And um, we went back uh, the following year to do a, an extensive documentary in this area. Um, so let's go forward. This is a repeat of the map. This is a, a little video walkthrough. Doug, you want to explain it? Yeah, this is a walkthrough of the, of the actual exhibition uh, that's uh, on display now at the Historic New Orleans Collection. Um, the video was done by the director uh, of, of the museum, John Lawrence. And we just wanted to give you a sense of what the actual exhibition looks like. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't seen it in the flesh either. COVID stole that experience from us. Um, but um, this exhibition is in a new building uh, recently opened by the historic uh, New Orleans collection. And that museum, if you've never been there, is really, um, it, it is the major museum focusing on uh, New Orleans and the Gulf Coast um, culture. And it's a splendid uh, museum. And I understand, uh, you can see from this, the new building is just spectacular. And John and his staff have mounted a, a beautiful looking show. Hopefully we'll be able to get there, perhaps at the end of the show. It runs until January 17th. John put in a number of artifacts, as you can see, a violin, a Mardi Gras costume from the Mardi Gras career to Mardi Gras in Mamou, Louisiana, which we photographed, and uh, other objects that reflect uh, life, work, and uh, festivities. Let's hold on this slide here, or, right. or on this part. This this, is a, you want to explain it, Doug? Yeah, um, this was a, a wonderful uh, idea on the part of John Lawrence, the director. Um, uh, this is a, a screen that allows viewers to see all of our contact sheets and, and to um, give the general viewing public the opportunity to identify places and more importantly people who are in these photographs that were done 47 years ago. So, th so this way the museum will have a, you know, a more complete archive and, if, and the museum actually will have this entire collection we, we have given this collection to the museum to be archived there for future um, research. And we hope that as many people from the Cajun parishes are able uh, to come and actually take part in this and identify some of the people that we, ne we did not identify in 1974. There are over 3,000 images in this archive, in this in the accumulative uh, contact sheets. Uh, I think there's a generation around that doesn't even know what a contact sheet is, by the way. We used all film and we just 
Good, let's go through and finish the uh, this Yes, thing. I want to make one correction. John has corrected me uh, and is saying that he is the director of programs, not the director of the entire museum. But he's our director. That's what's important. He's our curator, and John has been and our involved champion. with his work since the 70s, by the way. So. It's also Nathan Abshire in the background. And the music of Nathan Abshire, by the way, is the grandfather of modern Cajun music and referred to by anybody who's interested in, in, in Cajun culture and Cajun music. Um, and we were lucky enough to photograph him several times and other Cajun and Zydeco musicians as well while we were down there. Uh, it, all, the culture that we discovered uh, was not known as it is today because of food and music, which have become very popular throughout the United States. Um, so now we'll, I think we'll turn this over now to Tristan to talk about current day issues with the disappearing wetlands. Sure, thanks, thanks guys for having me on. Um, I actually got to see your exhibit a couple weeks ago and it's really awesome. It's really well done. And people should go see it now if they can before our city goes on another uh, COVID lockdown. So there's a little bit of time um, so Doug and Charles have described their book as kind of going uh, back in time as though it were a time machine. And living here now, it, it really does feel true. I'm, I'm from the Seattle area. And what I imagine Cajun country to be was a lot like what you see in their photos, wooden shacks in the swamp and guys and, you know, little fishing boats and hunting muskrat and shrimping and crabbing and all that stuff. Um, but the state has uh, changed dramatically over the past 40 or 50 years. And uh, the biggest change uh, is in the landscape. Um, and you can see the landscape here in this photo. You know, it's, it's not a typical, what, what, you know, a lot of people think of as the coastline. It's not sandy beaches or rocky shores. It's, it's these kind of endless marshes. And uh, that landscape is, is unraveling quite fast. Um, Louisiana's uh, lost about a quarter of its wetlands, uh, the swamps and marshes since the 1930s. So that's about 2,000 square miles. And that's the equivalent of, of the state of Delaware basically disappearing from the map. Um, and that rate of loss really hit its peak when Doug and Charles were, were here in the 70s. Um, the current rate of loss in, in Louisiana is about one football field every 100 minutes. Um, and the vast majority of that is marshland, like you see in this photo. Uh, we can go to the next, next slide. So here's, here's Louisiana today. Um, it's already changed <laughs> a bit from, you know, what you see on a typical map of Louisiana. The, the typical boot-shaped uh, state is, is, uh, has almost completely lost its toe. Um, we'll go to the next one, next slide. And here's how bad things could be in about 50 years. Um, whole communities uh, have disappeared and will disappear if we don't take pretty dramatic action. Um, islands have been lost and will continue to be lost. And uh, salt, water, salt water is reaching further inland. Let's go to the next slide. So the, the reasons for this loss are, are complicated. Um, a number of factors have caused the land loss. One is the oil industry, which dug uh, thousands of canals through coastal marshes in search of the oil, in search of oil. And these uh, canals, which you can see in this photo, they're, they're just kind of scars in the marshes, um, have brought in uh, plant killing salt water and have increased erosion. Um, and then there's also the impact of storms, which always uh, tear chunks of the state away every time we get a big hurricane. Uh, there's the levying of the Mississippi River, which uh, presents or prevents floods from happening. 
And those floods are what replenish the land with river sediment. So what we're losing, we don't get back because we don't get that sediment. And uh, then there's sea level rise. Uh, Louisiana already is one of the most vulnerable stretches of coastline uh, to uh, sea level rise. And uh, it's only gonna get worse in the years ahead due to climate change. Um, the estimates are always changing, but right now it looks like sea level rise could be as high as about a half an inch uh, per year over the next uh, 50 years. And go to the next one. And I really like this uh, image that we had in the New York Times uh, project. Uh, you can really see the changes here. Um, on the one side, you have the populated area that's along the bayou, which is the, the naturally higher ground. And then as you move over to the right, you see the landscape is sort of thinning out. The land is sinking, the salt water is intruding. And as you can see further on to the right, um, the trees are dying out. Um, and basically these, these changes have torn away the land that uh, Cajun people are so connected to. Um, these marshes and swamps, have, you know, they support fur trapping and moss gathering and crabbing and fishing. All these ways of life that have really faded away from a lot of these uh, communities. And, uh, you know, it's also made them more vulnerable to flooding and storms uh, because those marshes are uh, serving as a buffer against storm surge. And without them, the increasing number of storms that we're getting are, are hitting harder, damaging homes, fishing boats, fishing communities. And we can go to the next one. And this, this image uh, shows uh, our epic levee system. So this is kind of the biggest way that Louisiana is adapting to these changes. Um, and that the big one is levees, you know, especially since Katrina, there, there's been sort of a building boom of these large earthen mounds and concrete walls. And basically it's like a fortress. And when storms come, we kind of draw in the gates and sort of batten down the hatches. And, uh, but outside of these levees, those uh, coastal communities that um, Doug and Charles were visiting are, are really fading. Um, and we had a project, that project with the New York Times about a, a year ago, uh, we focused on one of those communities, the town of Lafitte. Um, we can show the next image of their levee system. So Le Lafitte being outside the levee system, they're, they're, they're on their own. They're basically building uh, what they can, uh, mostly uh, with state or local help, no federal help. and um, you know, that's, that's their biggest thing. And, and hopefully, you know, they don't get a big enough storm to wipe them out, but it does pretty well for small storms. Um, but uh, we can go to the next slide. And, you know, another big adaptation that's happened is, is in housing. So this is, this is a photo they took in the 70s, and this was very typical back then. Um, it's a low to the ground, kind of a wooden shack, sort of a house, shotgun houses. Um, and outside the levee system, those are pretty much gone. We can go to the next picture. And now uh, pretty much every house kind of looks like this, maybe not quite as big as this one. Um, but this is a big adaptation of just, you know, raising houses sometimes uh, by 20 feet. Um, and in a lot of these communities, you know, they just, they just have sandbags at the ready. They're just ready for storms and uh, flooding is just part of the routine. You can go to the next photo. And this is, this is also in Lafitte. These are some kids enjoying kind of a temporary lake in their front yard during a, a recent tropical storm. Um, but uh, fewer and fewer people are making their living off the land and the sea on the coast. Uh, which are, you know, things that are just ingrained in the Cajun culture and identity. Um, but, you know, many Cajun people have, have turned away from those traditions, those traditional ways of life, like rice farming and shrimping. And they've really uh, kind of turned to the oil industry. We go to the next slide. Yeah. And here's, here's a picture of Port Fouchon that they took. It's in Lafouche Parish. 
um, and we can go to the next slide. And here it is today, uh, a very different place. This uh, Port Fushan is now the largest oil port in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, nobody lives there. It's just a vast industrial area um, servicing all the platforms that are out, out in the offshore. And, uh, but, you know, even, even that, you know, even that industry isn't what it once was. Um, the oil industry still has, you know, a lot of jobs in Louisiana, but uh, fewer and fewer uh, jobs as the country shifts to, to fracking and natural gas and companies are finding uh, cheaper places to, to drill for oil. Let me go to the last one. And, um, but there, there are still efforts to preserve the culture in Louisiana, um, although it's not nearly as well organized or funded or backed by the government as in like uh, Quebec or French speaking Canada. Um, you, you really have to search high and low to find people who still uh, speak fluently uh, the Cajun French. Um, you know, typically it'll be people in, in their 80s um, that, that are still speaking the language, but their children and certainly their grandkids have, you know, really kind of turned away or, or it's just not a part of the culture as it used to be. So basically things are changing, but the Cajuns, they're extremely adaptable people. Um, within a span of a few generations, you know, they adapted uh, to, from life in France to life in Eastern Canada and then to South Louisiana, and they continue to adapt. And um, I really liked this photo because in it is, is a pirogue over to the left, and it's the traditional boat of the Cajuns. And it's a, a really good example of how uh, Cajuns have adapted and, cha and changed their ways over time. Um, the first pirogues were dug out of cypress logs, but as those were logged out or died from land loss, Cajuns shifted to sheets of milled wood like the one you see here. And now the only uh, wooden pirogues you see are kind of rotting away in people's yards. And uh, the modern pirogue is, is made of fiberglass. It looks identical to the one you see here, but it's just a, a different material. Um, and they're not really used for trapping or fishing anymore, but they do race them. And so they're changing yet again into these long, narrow, <laughs> kind of sleek boats. And uh, that's yet another adaptation um, while kind of, you know, Cajuns are keeping a link to their past. So and I'll turn it over to you guys, take us back to the past. I, I thought uh, just to change our, our order a little bit, maybe there are a few questions that some of the people in the audience want to ask you, Tristan, now. Are there any such that uh, people want to ask before we go on into the next segment? Anybody want to? Yeah, I, I guess I'd like to uh, ask a question, Christian. Christian, is it, uh, so you said that uh, a lot of people from Arcadiana are now working in the oil industry. Right. Um, So my question is, uh, what do they say about uh, global warming and climate change? And do, is that is that are those the kinds of concerns that uh, are on my mind uh, often? Uh, are they on the minds uh, in, in, of the Acadian people who are uh, working in this oil industry? I mean, how how are they managing what? seems like a dichotomy to me. And I really appreciate what you said about um, the adaptability of these people and how important that is and how it was a beautiful kind of historical uh, run through that you did there. But it was kind of interesting on you know, how people are dealing with these kinds of contradictions. I think, I think they're very aware of the changes. I mean, they, they can't help but see them. You know, like they can't help but see sea level rise and, and the effects of climate change. And I think that generally there's um, a, a more broad acceptance that the climate is changing here in Louisiana than you might find in other uh, more conservative states or, you know, red-leaning states than, you know, in, in other parts of the country. But I think there might be more 
um, uh, disputing the idea of what's causing the climate change. You know that that there there may be disagreement that you know it's coming from you know it's human caused. It's coming from burning these fossil fuels that we're extracting from the state. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, with everything going on, and as the oil industry is drawing back and losing its importance, are they doing anything? positive in the reclamation of land from the short of, from the canals, et cetera, et cetera? There's a, a really ambitious um, land restoration program here in the state. We have uh, a 50 year, $50 billion coastal plan. And uh, a lot of that money is from the BP oil uh, settlement. And so, you know, it's, it's more money than the state could have ever dreamed of for this purpose of restoration. So the, it's, it's a really ambitious project and they are, um, you know, they're, they're restoring uh, barrier islands, they're building back marshes. Um, it's, it's a pretty, pretty amazing project that they're doing. I have a question or a statement. Um, I've done the bayou. I have a friend who actually was a worked for the company and when she realized she and her husband they were captains when they realized what the oil industry was doing they swapped over and so they do several and one of the things that she talked about and you sort of glossed over it was that truly the oil companies and what they did because of the shift osm osmotically with the salt water and the fresh water and that is the destruction of the barriers and the land so that therefore when the storms come in the land that would normally hold them back the flooding that occurs down in that area is more rapid and higher because of the change and the shift from the oil companies yes no what do you know about it yeah, that's true. I mean, the, the canals that the oil companies dug are, are having a huge impact. And that's one area where you, know, you might expect to see a little bit more of a focus in refilling the canals. Um, I've been surprised about that, that that really isn't, hasn't been an emphasis here in the state. Um, it's expensive and it's complicated because they have to get buy-in from property owners. And that makes it difficult because you you know to fill in one canal, you might be dealing with you know dozens of property owners, and some of those property owners actually like the canals. They, you know, it's great for fishing. It gives them great access into deeper marsh, and so that that is that's a big challenge. Well, I have a question. Oh. Sorry. Go ahead, Nicole. Oh, I just had a question. Well, I'm from South Terrebonne, and uh, so this is pretty close to my heart. So I was wondering if um, you knew of any organization, like organized efforts or groups that are documenting the vanishing culture of this fragile area, instead of just, you know, the erosion is happening at such a rate that, you know, our people are dispersing so quickly, so we're losing it, you know, at such a unprecedented rate. So I'm just kind of wondering if there was anything, you know, me or someone I know could get involved with to just document as, you know, people get older and they die off and we lose a lot of that culture. So uh, do you know of any groups or organizations? I, I don't know of any myself. And, you know, I think they do exist. Okay. Um, they're, they're just very small. They're very small groups. And this is my impression of I me. Mean, I don't, I don't uh, cover the cultural end of, of, of things. I'm pretty right. focused on right. environment. Okay. But my impression is, you know, a lot of them uh, try to do this and they, they run up against, you know, funding. Getting right. funding. There's just, yeah. <clears throat> I've done a lot of volunteer work and that's kind of what I've been trying to, to keep up with, just free work to get as much information and oral histories as possible. But I yeah. guess it's just the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, th I think we ought to go on and we'll take more questions later later on uh, as we move through. Uh, you can always send us a chat question as well, which we'll 
read and talk about at the end. Um, so that was then, uh, now that was what is going on now. And I think in some relatively conscious moving to consciousness as we lived in Louisiana, we understood the great value of this unique culture uh, that was totally American, but of French origin. And uh, by the way, they spoke Patois. We took some French lessons before we went down there. It turned out it was the wrong kind of French. Nobody understood it. We never learned it. Um, so- I want to try for Jude uh, here or something else. What? Somebody, oh, sorry. Um, and the pictures you're about to see now uh, reflect uh, the kind of industry that occurred, oil and such, uh, while we while we were there, as we photographed that, you know, they, they, certainly the oil culture was a very big part of at least the labor that Cajuns uh, were engaged in. You want to talk about these as we go through, Doug? Yeah, I think we can both uh, talk about them. I remember being being very impressed uh, when we when we uh, first started talking with people who worked out on the Gulf, out on the platforms, uh, I think that the oil, the oil industry obviously changed their way of life uh, in many ways, it provided a, a good income. But um, I was very impressed with the fact that the men who worked out on the platforms, the Cajun men, would leave their fa families, go out to the platform for seven days, eight days, nine days, leave their families, and then they come back for seven or eight days. That's a total turnaround of the normal sort of nine to five or, or 7.30 to 3.30 life. And um, I, I was very uh, impressed with that at the time. And these pictures, um, you know, we, we did we did what we found we tried you know we realized that this was a very unique culture we thought we thought at first uh, that we were in we could have been in a foreign country I mean, we were hearing language we didn't understand we were eating food that we had never had before and we were hearing music that we hadn't really heard before um cajun music uh, really first started to appear it was first uh, brought to the um uh to the newport folk festival in 64 i think by ralph rensler from the smithsonian so that was you know really uh, nine years before we got there so there were some people in the uh, folk music world who knew what cajun music was but uh, i don't think many people knew what Cajun life was, daily life was like at all. And, you know, like in, uh, in many cultures, the music usually opens up doors. And I think it, it did that also uh, here. You know, the music became popular and then the people became more interested in Cajun life. And I think it greatly increased tourism without a doubt. So next, we're going to go to uh, just the more non oil, non industry oriented kinds of work uh, that we encountered, which really reflected uh, a much smaller but intimate in industry of, of people who had a heritage of living off the water and the bounty of that landscape. Um, this is a crab fisherman somewhere, I think. This is when, when men still wore real hats. <laughs> uh, no, no baseball hats here. But one of the things that we were aware of is that we were making a document. I think we had that term. We knew we were making a documentary or a document of the Cajun culture. And we went there with really no exact plan of how we would do it but rather that we would move wherever the car took us each day or wherever someone said, oh, you should go see the man who makes nets for fishing or, and 
uh, we had, we were as outsiders in a sense, we had an objectivity, I think that, and an openness that allowed us to look at anything and everything that interested us. Um, I think we were very, became very conscious in the process that we were photographing something that in fact would probably disappear. Uh, and, you know, in, in addition to uh, climate change and global warming storms that seem endless, particularly this year, I'm sure for anybody along the coast, uh, the, the, the sheer uh, imposition of modern culture and uh, commercial culture into that landscape occurred probably, it was probably inevitable, but it also occurred as the I-90 was finished, I think in about 66 I or 67, huh? I mean, I-10, I the I-10, yeah. which gave easy access into the Atchafalaya Basin, uh, whereas before you had to go down to New Orleans and back around and it took, you know, four to six hours to get there from New Orleans or from the North for that matter. And once that interstate opened, uh, things changed. And that was just a few years before we were there. I think we were, we were fortunate to have stumbled upon it as we did in 1973. It was really, um, we were really on the cusp of uh, I, of the culture, I think, uh, changing. There, there had been there were efforts that are taking place in the state to to revive uh, the culture and in a in a positive way because being a Cajun wasn't always um, looked upon uh, favorably historically in the state, but um, we were there, I think, at a turning point and um, where things were still genuine, small. Uh, there was a, a lot of work being, manual work being done, traditional occupations uh, were, were taking place. Um, I don't remember, you know, large, uh, you know, there were no box stores. It was still small businesses, mom and pop shops. Uh, but it was, I think, just beginning to change. Um, the, this picture is on a little island somewhere near Fala on the, on the coast, and it was uh, the home of a man named Dargar, Dargar, and his daughters we met, and they were on their way back on a boat from school. And we, I think we spent the night there uh, with his family. Uh, he hunted, fished, and, and John Lawrence, if you can hear me, do you know what this rack was for? We have forgotten. It's, um, it's a fur drying rack. There, if you look real, real hard on the lower register, you can see these sort of parabola shaped wire frames. They sort of merge with the background, but the skins of the muskrat and nutria were stretched onto those and put out in the sun to dry. So this is part of the seasonal activities that the family would have uh, would have done. And, and I think, you know, that is the biggest change that um, uh, the oil industry brought. It, uh, it's been alluded to, but um, work for many of the people, especially on the coast, was a seasonal thing. You trapped in the season, you shrimped in the season, you hunted ducks in the season, you farmed in the season, uh, maybe uh, hired yourself out when none of those other things were productive, but uh, the oil industry gave people, whether it was seven on or seven off or nine to five, or uh, it, it gave people steady and consistent work, which a lot of people appreciated. Sure, and needed, yeah. Um, this is the iconic moss that we know of uh, the South. Um, and- uh, Spanish moss. It, yes. It, like everything else, it gets used. And uh, Doug, you want to explain this? Or? Uh, this is a picker. We, were, we went uh, out into the swamp in small boats. And uh, this man, this is a man who had been doing this for years, using a pole with a hook on it to pull the moss down. And John, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, wasn't the moss traditionally used 
to stuff mattresses? That was, yeah, mattresses, other forms of upholstery. Um, uh, and yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was mostly for that. Uh, I think the last Moss Gen in the state was in Melville, Louisiana, up the Atchafalaya. I, I photographed it in the early 90s, and I think it was closed by then, so. Yeah. And this is this uh, this portrait is uh, at a moss gin where where the moss is is collected and cleaned <laughs> and cleaned. Yeah. This is a um, the, the, this is nutria nutria skins, which uh, you know was a I guess a a, a fairly lucrative. Uh, uh, occupation at the time. Now, uh, Tristan, Tristan can speak to this. I understand the Nutria have uh, uh, become, have, have ex their population has exploded and now they're a problem because they're eating away at the roots of the wetlands. Is that true, Tristan? Yeah, that's, that's yet another uh, of the many causes of, of land loss is, is the Nutria. And we actually have a a nutria bounty in the state. If you turn in a nutria tail, you get six bucks. Oh. Yeah. This is uh, a big clam, <laughs> <laughs> a heart, and other things. And uh, I think it's, it speaks to the fact that we just wanted to bring our own vision to all of this as we were conscious of making a documentary not a record, but uh, a personal exploration of what we saw and what we encountered throughout five to six months, I think. I'm not even sure how long we were down there now. It's an Ed Weston, but adding humans. <laughs> I didn't hear you, what? It's an Ed Weston, but adding humans. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, you, you, bring up, uh, you bring up Edward Weston from the history of photography. It, it might be useful for people to know that you know, when we arrived um, in our heads uh, were images uh, we had learned about the, the uh, history of photography uh, in graduate school. And we knew, we knew the work of the 19th century landscape photographers who, who photographed uh, uh, the West, who, who accompanied the expeditions in the exploration of the West. So we knew those iconic classic images. We knew the work of August Sander, his portrait work in Germany in the 20s and 30s, and where he did an entire body of work um, uh, of people in various occupations and various uh, sociological levels of the, uh, of the culture. Uh, you know, we, we knew of the Farm Security Administration work that had gone on in the 30s. You know, that's, these are the things that kind of uh, informed the basis of uh, our vision. And then we applied, applied our own, I'd say our own vision to it. But we were, I guess you could say we were classically trained. This, this picture of Mr. Dufresne holding up one of his French loaves of bread that's kind of hard on the outside and soft on the inside. I don't believe it's found very much anymore, uh, this kind of bread. And it was beautifully wrapped like this with his thing. And this is in Golden Meadow, which was a uh, place where a lot of the shrimp boats and, and, and oyster and clam boats left from uh, going into the Gulf. Uh, I know that it has been affected, big, there's a big sprawl there, but it has also been affected by the storms. Is that not right, uh, our two New Orleans, Tristan and John? It, it has been affected, but it's, it's within the um, uh, levee. good levee system. Uh, and this is carving you know, the ducks for, you know, uh, decoy hunting. Um, we were very conscious of making portraits of people and their life and uh, the things that they cherished. And almost all of them reflect uh, a kind of pride about, at that time, that was building about being a Cajun and the Cajun culture 
And I must say, we were welcomed everywhere. We were never felt like we were intruding outsiders. We were fed to death. We drank the strongest coffee that upset my stomach today. And uh, we were always welcome as if we had been down there forever. Uh, and I think that's still a trait of the Cajun culture today. Young boy with a 22. Okay. Innocent and not about the gun culture we have today or that we know about today. What kind okay. of camera were y'all using? What's that? What kind of camera were y'all using? Uh, we were using a variety of cameras. Um, they were all large format. We were using four by five view cameras. We, we were using roll film like this, four by five negatives of this size. We, we hardly ever used any, thir any small format 35 millimeter because we were very, in being classically trained, we were very interested in, in description, in the highest descriptive, um, information that we could get and that meant in those days the bigger the film the more description oh, that counts for the depth of field yeah yeah so clearly you know not using small cameras we were not invisible you know we came loaded with big cameras that people had never seen before um, and and the people, I, th I think we were able to convey to people that we were very interested in who they were and what they and what they did. Um, I think they appreciated uh, the interest that we had in in their lives, and there was no suspicion. I don't think you could do a similar project today in anywhere in the United States quite like that and be be accepted. We did, um, actually, I'll show you something that might be humorous. Uh, at one point, we did decide we had some shirts made. I don't know if you can see this. We went to a uniform store and had some shirts made, <laughs> our names on them, so that when we rolled into town or anywhere up to a house, uh, we were official, <laughs> and it uh, it worked very well, actually. We um, we we were very also interested in, in in things that even then were disappearing. Like this woman has a what they call a garcelet. It's a special hat uh, that probably harkens back to uh, peasant France uh, in some way. But look at this beautiful quilt she made. She was known for her quilt and uh, quite, quite remarkable. Um, everything we experience always sort of reflected back upon the water. This is a man who's out with his son who's crippled. Uh, he's caught fish, he shot a bird, and uh, he's proud of, of it. We just probably were rolling along the, the levee and spotted him. Uh, Living off the land. Always, no one shunned us off. I don't think we ever got dismissed in <coughs> uh, This is a rice uh, paddy. Uh, rice field, yeah. Field. Yes, not, uh, I, I suppose we should explain that not all of those Cajun parishes that you saw on the map are, uh, are a total water world. In the more northern sections, um, there's more, it's flat and more, more somewhat prairie-like. Uh, and that's where, for example, the Cajun, uh, the Cajun Mardi Gras takes place in that area. That's quite a snake. Uh, this is, you know, there, we saw a lot of these are kind of maybe a, a permanent home, but it also may have been a camp where people went to hunt and fish and spend the weekend and whatever. Uh, frankly, I don't remember, but. But there was a good deal of, you could see you have to go across planks to get over to it. Uh, this is Galliano, I believe, again, 
people, you know, Louisiana is known for its above ground graveyard, but you can see there are homes on either side of this graveyard and then the industry, fishing industry is prominent there. Um, besides all the work, there's the festivities. You saw this picture earlier of Nathan Abshire at the Mamou Mardi Gras, which is, we'll tell you more about as we move on. Um, Cajun music, by the way, is very different. Doug, you want to explain uh, Cajun music and Zydeco and those distinctions? Well, I, I mean, they're, 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 they, uh, the Zydeco music, uh, this is Clifton Chenier, and, and Zydeco is, uh, is a Creole music, whereas um, Nathan Abshire, is, uh, he, is a, he is a Cajun. And uh, they're related, but, but, uh, but very different. I think the Zydeco music has elements of the blues in it, and um, you know, it's a mixture, more of a mixture of Cajun and blues and country. Almost anywhere you went, you had the experience of encountering musicians, amateur and semi-professional. And uh, today I think Cajun music has spread, changed more contemporary, uh, but uh, it, it seemed to be in the background of everything we did. Uh, whoops. Um, move on to the next. There. Yeah, uh, this is a, uh, I, think, I think this is an important uh, picture in terms of the history of the music because this is a photograph inside of Fred's Lounge, which is in Mamou where the Cajun Mardi Gras takes place. But what's important about it really is that, um, I think it was 1962 when Rivon Reed started broadcasting Cajun music out of this bar on Saturday mornings. And it was one of those broadcasts that Ralph Rinsler heard on the radio, actually as he was leaving an, an explore, exploratory trip to Louisiana, and he heard Cajun music, turned around and went there. That's how Cajun music, Cajun musicians were first uh, invited to the Newport Folk Festival and then spread to the world. But, um, you know, this is a typical scene on a Saturday morning inside the bar as they're broadcasting to the Cajun community. And there's a little booze on the table from Kentucky, by the way, if you take a close look and a few slits and <laughs> other things. But uh, this is um, Rothard Nightclub, uh, very famous in Borough Bridge, where we lived uh, in a little apartment above a garage. <laughs> we developed film in the bathtub and made some contacts in on a fairly regular basis to see what we were doing. Um, this man is actually in some kind of state of ecstasy, I would say. And these were called fado dos because in the back, uh, there were often uh, young girls taking care of children uh, who were brought so that the whole family could come together, which was another experience that we had never had as big cities, stilted human beings, uh, going to a dance or a performance or something like that with everybody of all ages and family. Yes, sir. This is Everything a, had a little twist when it came to ceremonies or festivities. Cajun bride with good luck dollar bills pinned to her veil. This was the, I think, maybe the first or second or third, I'm not sure, but one of the very early crawfish festivals in Brobridge, Louisiana which has apparently become a huge event since then. It was pretty big when we were there. And um, actually, I, I, found, I, I recently uh, did a little research um, because I was curious and found that the Crawfish Festival actually got started there in Brobridge in 1960. Now we came uh, 14 years later, but it was still a, it was still small enough to be held in the streets of the of Bro Bridge, which at that time was a 
tiny little town. So the population exploded to thousands of people celebrating crawfish in the streets. Music, parades, uh, crawfish races like this. Of course, a lot of drinking and, and um, it was still small enough to be a local, a small event like, you know, relatively small like that. Unfortunately, I've seen uh, what's happened in recent years. I guess it's gotten so popular, so big that it's moved to the fairgrounds. And, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's more, it's not historical, but it's, it's the whole nature of its change if it's not in the streets in the small town as we experienced it. This is the Mamu Mardi Gras, which is a rite of passage for young men. Women were not allowed to go on the ride. They ride across the countryside uh, in costume, but mostly homemade costumes, by the way. And there was one, there's one in the show that John, you may have seen when we did the walkthrough. Um, and at the end of the day, they have collected bounty, so to speak, by performing at farmhouses and every place they stop. By the end of the day, everybody's pretty, pretty drunk, uh, really drunk. And uh, uh, it's called the Career de Mardi Gras. And it's an all day celebration. I think we got there at five in the morning and we probably didn't get out of there until 12 that night. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very different event uh, than the Mardi Gras celebration that takes place in New Orleans. You know, this is a country event. Primarily, the riders are on horseback. If you were, uh, and as, as Charles mentioned, uh, part of what took place there was uh, that it was a rite of passage. If you're a young man uh, wanting to ride in this career de Mardi Gras, you had to petition to, to El Capitan to see if you were, he thought you were ready, mature enough to ride which also meant to ride and drink throughout the day. <laughs> and what would happen in, what happens in this, uh, this kind of a, a Mardi Gras, the career, is that they ride from farmhouse to farmhouse. They ride into the yard, music is played, they get off the horses and dance, and they ask the owners for food for something for the gumbo for the community gumbo that's going to take place at the end of the day so they'll be given rice chicken and um, they do a little dance to entertain uh, the people you know the people who have made the offering and then on their way with more drinking and music uh, to the next farmhouse so it was very different from what you experience in new orleans this, this is the Mothman reappearing from using moss for his content. And the, the evening festivities go on with music, dancing, and everything imaginable in this small town of Mamou. This next slide is um, a trail ride. Uh, there are a lot of these. Uh, it's not like the Mardi Gras. It's families and communities get together and they take an all-day ride and spend the night somewhere uh, camping and ride back. And it was again, full of the same kind of antics and festivities and uh, joy, I would say. I think that this, I think a lot of them, uh, certainly this one uh, that we went on this day was on a levee road. Yeah. Uh, along a levee road where there's very little traffic and they were just be a hundred horseback riders and uh, some pickup trucks following them with, uh, with food and camping uh, equipment. And it was, it's just another way that the Cajun people love to, how they love to have a good time. And they, they know how to do it. As we've said all along, food is kind of a major element in holding uh, the traditions and, and the community together and the family gatherings. Uh, I don't know to what extent uh, this kind of thing happens now, and I'm sure Tristan and John could answer that. This is a boucherie. Uh, a pig is uh, 
water is cooked and all day long or for many hours. Uh, in this particular case, it hung from a tree over a pit and everything is used in one way or another uh, for creating boudin and all the entrails are used and uh, a big fest occurs at the end of the uh, afternoon and uh, we had never seen anything like it. Uh, and uh, this is sort of a little record of it. Uh, it, it occurred in uh, in New Iberia, I believe. Yeah. And there was music there too. There were bands playing. We have pictures of all the music. By the way, we have thousands of pictures that anybody is interested in going a little deeper into any of these subjects can certainly do by either looking at the book or or going and looking at the somehow to the archive that John is preserving. The, the, the pervert. <laughs> this, the was the, this was our favorite restaurant in Bro Bridge where we ate, took many of our meals. And I mean, that's, that's just a, a big tray of crawfish. Mama Tebow. It's Mama and, uh, kitchen. Is the restaurant still in operation? Do you know? I I I have not. Uh, I haven't been back to Bro Bridge for many years. I did drive through with my daughter on a barbecue road trip a number of years, about nine years ago, eight nine years ago, and I didn't recognize the town, so I I couldn't say. Yeah. But last slide. Right, is uh, eight pictures of a little trip to the marsh in the bayou. Uh, this is the Chafalaya Basin. And uh, what you got? Hmm? Somebody said something? Uh, and you can see a high water mark on the trees on the far right, uh, on all of the trees actually. And, it, it, it's quite unique and quite beautiful uh, if you've never been in, in a swamp and uh, full of mystery and full of all kinds of uh, bounty as well as a lot of mosquitoes and so on. We did the grids. There are a number of grids like this in the exhibition that John Lawrence mounted at the uh, Historic New Orleans Collection Museum. They're quite large. And uh, so this is uh, this is the way it's presented there at the museum. And lastly, the cover of the book, which John really helped edit, organize, and the museum HNOC produced, and it's on sale from them. And part of the funds are going to wetlands preservation. Uh, also, I just wanted to make, uh, make a mention of uh, our designer, Tana Coleman, who um, it was a marriage made in design heaven, as far as I was concerned. I think uh, she did an incredible job and her, her sensibility and ours just melded. And I think uh, she designed a beautiful book. I'm gonna close the... Uh the screen and so now we can have questions and hopefully we have some answers or you might have already spoken of this when you were talking but have you either one of you <coughs> been back since you did the no. photographic not not really no no we were I mean, we were we were hoping to go back we were going to make a little oh you were going to go for the go back for, for the, the opening, opening which was supposed to be in april yeah didn't happen, right? Oh, well, maybe next year. I, I've been back a couple times, not recently, but not for any more than a day into uh, parts of the Gulf Coast, South uh -huh. Louisiana. But no. Um, so we'll go back and maybe I don't want to go back. Maybe I don't want to see what's lost. I'm not sure. Right. <laughs> sure. Well, we got some questions. Um, so, that culture, you were thinking of the idea of doing the show, would it, 
I mean, you're in college, you're in grad school, you're finishing. How did Make it filming, uh, shooting a documentary, a Cajun culture, Germany, where did it come from? Was it mutual? Was someone a lead person? Where did the uh, did the do this come from? That if you uh, if you buy the book and read the uh, <laughs> the essay, uh, you you will see that oh. uh, we were taking uh, Charles and I were taking uh, a road trip in the winter to get away from the cold in Chicago, and we ended up traveling along the Mississippi Road, and basically through uh, talking with someone on the side of the road, they recommended that we perhaps go over to the Cajun country. We had no idea what a Cajun was. We didn't know a Cajun from a Creole person. And we went over there and we were astounded. It was like being in another co foreign country. So we came uh, back. Serendipitous and spontaneous. It was, it was serendipitous, but we came back, did our research, quit our jobs, and went back down and lived. We were 30. We could do it then. Yeah. yeah. 30 is a good year. That's right. It so, was a good. It was an, it was an incredible year. So. Has that culture uh, maintained any uh, connection with the Cape Breton? Well, with what? what? The, the Cape Breton and Canadian version. I mean, their music, the fiddle music is somewhat al alike and, and their language is somewhat alike. And I don't know if they maintain that connection. I think John, uh, John I think Lawrence. There is, um, I'm not intimately familiar with it, but every <clears throat> four years, I think there is a réunion uh, in Cape Breton with the Louisiana and the Canadian communities. So yeah, there is, uh, there is an effort to, um, to, uh, to maintain those uh, historical ties uh, among families whose branches separated and, you know, live in different, very different places now. Actually, along those lines, we hope at some point in the future to travel this exhibition to Canada and to that part of the that part of Canada specifically. May I ask a question? I'm not sure yeah, if anyone please do. Um, I had heard a comment that the oil industry success in that area may have helped kind of keep the Cajun culture and Cajun community together because they didn't have to leave home to get jobs. Is that kind of commonly agreed upon? I don't know. Uh, sounds reasonable. Uh, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. clearly, I mean, John, I think can probably speak to this. Certainly, I, more. I, I don't know for sure, but I, like, like you, I think it's certainly um, plausible. I, I mean, the, it, it's a reason for, um, for families to stay together rather than to leave. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And it's thought of positively, the oil industry, I don't know, oil rigs, all of that kind of the offshore, you know, um, job opportunities meant it was a positive, it was perceived as a positive thing. I don't know. Then, certainly. Mm -hmm. I suspect you know, Tristan has a more contemporary yes. take on that. <laughs> right, uh, right. I mean, yeah. I, think, I, think, I think that's kind of a lot of people's goal is to move from the more traditional livings on the coast, like shrimping, which is difficult work and it's unpredictable. And to get a, you know, a 40 hour a week job in the oil industry with benefits. So mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of people would like to do that. Thank you. Somebody mentioned in the, question. In the chat uh, <clears throat> that we should mention Alan Lomax. Uh, who recorded Cajun music in the 1930s, and I'm sure Ralph Rinsler was aware yeah. of that, and uh, who was a, 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 a historian and uh, archivist of, of American folk music. Um, this goes to show that, you know, there's always somebody before, and uh, <laughs> uh, that, uh, 
the music is 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 is, is essential and it, it lives for sure, uh, even though it's morphed into new forms. Um, I would just like to say one thing about photography in this. Um, you know, I think we were photographers who were, I don't like the term fine art photographers because I don't know what it means exactly, but we were certainly photographers of the fine art <laughs> photography we appreciated it, we knew it, and whatever. And I think we brought values of whatever good photography would be first to making the document. And um, while it had no initial organization or, you know, directive, as they was given the Farm Security Administration photographers, uh, we wanted to make pictures and we knew that we were, again, I'm repeating myself, trying to do something through photographs which always preserve in something. They're always about something lost, something past, whatever. And um, I think, thanks to John, we, we have kept this together. We have kept it alive. And I'm happy it's in Louisiana uh, where hopefully it will live further as a document to what is lost. Um, and I think uh, all photography does that in some way. And, and, and it's very important that we were conscious of our social need to engage a culture. And we were conscious that we were going to preserve something. And finally, we could share it after all these years, 47 yeah, years. Which is great. Are what more happened? Questions? I, what happened between when you did you spent your time down there and you did the beautiful photographs, which really capture the story, and then how uh, did you show any of them prior to this? Did we, you have we had a we had a few small shows, but basically uh, we were not able to get much uh, traction with the pictures. We. We had shown uh, some preliminary work to John Lawrence at the museum, and he was very interested. Um, and uh, then we just, uh, we went on with our lives. But John knew the of the pictures, and I think over the years, um, you know, saw that they were growing in, in value and in meaning. And so, um, you know, it was his initiative uh, several years ago uh, to mount a major exhibition uh, of the work and, and put the, the, the full force of the Historic New Orleans Collection Museum uh, behind it. Good. And we're very grateful to him for doing that. Yeah, so am I, because I spend Thank half you. my time down there. So yes, okay. it's a Thank great you, museum. Thank you, Doug and Charles. I, I also wanted to tag on to what you just said and, and hopefully answer one of the chats about why it so long for the work to get shown. I, I mean, there are, there are so many reasons why that is. Um, uh, when this work was completed, it was essentially contemporary photography. We are not a contemporary photography institution. Uh, we were more New Orleans centered uh, in, in recent years. We've kind of broadened our uh, geographic and cultural perspective about what constitutes influences on our core mission of New Orleans history. And um, this really began, although we kept in touch over all the years. Uh, we did a symposium in 2009 where we did a small exhibition of these pictures. Doug and Charles came down and talked about it. And at that point, we really began to um, discuss uh, a full-throated exposure of the project. And knowing that, uh, I think by 2012, we had sort of set our plans for this new facility that would accommodate the type of exhibition that we knew this needed to be done. And then the exhibition calendar, the publication calendar, all these things have a lot longer lead time in our world than they do in some commercial time frame. So um, it, it took a long time, not because we didn't know what we were doing, but in some ways, exactly what we were doing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I didn't mean to imply that, John, by not by a long time. I, I think that's true with us on our end. I mean, when we did it, people weren't 
didn't know about Cajun culture, they said, okay, that's a documentary photographs or something like that. What's and, the big uh, deal? <laughs> yeah. uh, it wasn't such a, a thing that happened. We did do a few shows and then we had to go on about our lives. Uh, somebody asked a question about when we got there, did we go our separate ways and photograph separately? And the answer is no. Uh, we really melded our visions together. Uh, I think if you really ask us to tell you who did what picture, it would be very hard for us to even remember exactly. We, we really worked as, as, as a team and sometimes, you know, we would stop and one person would go on one side of the street and another, another side of the street or wander around to the back of the house or whatever. But uh, we were very conscious of melding and working together. Uh, I don't think we ever went out that I, I remember. No. Ourselves. I think it's, and that's, um, I think it's very, it's very unusual uh, in, in photography or in, uh, in, in actually probably a lot, well, in, in photography for two people to sort of set aside their egos and both work towards something which is really larger than both of, our, of us. You know, we weren't doing uh, a, a fine art photograph for the sake of itself. We had a larger goal, larger mission. And um, perhaps because we were such good friends, we were able to actually do that without clashing egos. Every photographer wants to just do it alone, usually. It's, it's photography, yeah. being a photographer is usually a lone profession. Um, Can I, yeah. um, as you're I shooting just, down in um, the Cajun groups, this is during a time of turmoil and change in American society. Is that merit in the society you're looking at, or are they still isolated from the main uh, they were isolated. The United States. They were. They were. They were pretty isolated. Yeah, <clears throat> and the culture was was intact. You know, the this uh, I-10 Federal Highway. You know that went that went from Baton Rouge over to Houston. It was only uh, completed, I think, as it 1960, John, or 60. Or, or even earlier, um, a little bit earlier. I remember biking a section of it between New Orleans and Laplace in the early '70s before it was open to traffic. So, yeah, it, it oh. probably had just opened when y'all were there. It, it just opened, yeah. Right, and so that really kept that entire region um, quite quite isolated, and you know, and it was not a uh, it was a, uh, a working man's. Uh, area that uh, I which was uh, people I did not seem to be interested in you know Cajuns actually uh, they fought to be able to speak their language in the schools the children at one point in the schools were no longer allowed to speak you know French their version of French which is very different from classical French and um, organizations began to spring up. I think it was in the actually 68, 1968, when an organization called Codafil uh, started bringing, bringing French speaking teachers from French speaking countries in, into the Cajun uh, school systems to, to advocate for the people continuing to speak French. Although what they were teaching was Parisian French, not the patois that the, the that Cajun people speak. So, somebody asked um, about the role of the Civil War and how the it interacted with the Cajun culture, or uh, and how they interacted with the issues of the Civil War. And frankly, I don't have um, an answer. I think maybe John might be able to answer that. I do know that. The Battle of Mansura, Louisiana, which is just at the northern end of the Cajun area, uh, uh, emancipated or newly emancipated or escaped slaves were very instrumental in the northern victory, uh, which was ultimately uh, uh, led to Vicksburg, etc. Um, and it was a very important battle. 
and those slaves, uh, you know, have intermingled also uh, with uh, Puma Indians and other uh, Indians, Native Americans. Um, and there, there is a community of mixture in the heart of Cajun land, which uh, kind of ultimately changes the, the, the description of who a Cajun is. And there's a, a large article that we could send anybody if they wanted about you know, the difference between Creole, Cajun, and, and mulatto, and so on and so forth. And I think many people, and certainly we, had no knowledge of those distinctions. And apparently, even contemporary Louisianans sometimes get it mixed up. Uh, Don, do you know anything? To, could you speak to the role of the Civil War in the Cajun culture? I, um, I, not as any sort of expert. I would, um, I, I think one of the consequences was that um, the the Civil War financially ruined so much of the planter and slaveholding class in the Mississippi Valley and had less of an effect on that um, in Acadiana because there were some slaveholding operations, but it was more subsistence farming. And so this kind of created a situation of where formerly wealthy people's um, sons and daughters were intermarrying with Acadians. Uh, the, the, that, that's a very, very one point and simplified view of a very complex problem. If, if people are interested in this and, and of the cultural uh, streams that you mentioned, Charles, there's a great little book of essays by Carl Brasso uh, called Cajun Creole Puma French. And it, it really sort of uh, gives the two and a half to three century view of, uh, of the, the mixing and separation of those cultures uh, over time. I, I would really recommend it to people who are interested in the subject. You know, in the, thank you. I'd like to get that book myself. I am directed. Uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, when we did this, there was this kind of notion, what they called the, the salad bowl idea of American cultures mixing like a salad with a little lettuce here, and little carrots here, and so on and so forth. And uh, there was a notion among sociologists and anthropologists that that was going to be what America could be uh, if we preserved the identities of things uh, within given regions and so on and so forth, and given uh, the identities of, of, of migrants and, and, and also immigrants, which we all are, uh, unless you're a Native American. Um, but somehow our culture took all that salad bowl and put it in a, in a blender and just made a mush of it. And I think a lot of that has happened in, in, in places all over this country and all over the world for that matter. Uh, we, we got a kind of a, a smoothie, I guess. Um, and I think I would urge creative people to try to find the, you know, the, the original plant, if you could, uh, whatever's left everywhere. Any uh, more questions? Have we answered all the... I, I have a question. Um, I grew up in Eunice, Louisiana. Can you speak um, up? I think your volume's down. Oh, can, uh, let's see. Can you turn the volume up? Thank you. Um, I grew up in Eunice, Louisiana. I'm a Prairie Cajun. And uh, I'm curious uh, when, uh, actually Nathan Abshar was my father's um, uh, garbage man. Uh, oh. growing, and, right, um, yeah. And, That's right, he was a garbage man, yep. Um, and uh, and spent some time in Mamu as well, and then I, I spent most of my time in Eunice. Um, my generation, so I'm 53, and um, we knew we were maybe even at the end of something very special in terms of the isolation and the specialness of our culture. Um, but there was a love-hate um, because of what our grandparents and parents had been through in the sense that um, what we loved was also inferior 
And so also, I think people are always conflicted about the isolation that they have, you know, uh, it's a double-edged sword. So I was wondering, did you get a sense of any of that when you were interviewing people? I can't quite, I loved the show and I can't quite remember the years, but, um, you know, sort of um, right after I graduated high school, there was a, a lot, we didn't get a lot of Codafil where I was, but um, there was a lot of Cajun pride and, and all of that, but my generation missed it. And we also missed out on French. French was everywhere and I can speak and understand some and my grandparents spoke it and my parents somewhat, but um, we we're kind of like a little lost generation there. And I was wondering if you got the sense from anyone, did anyone speak about that dilemma? I think when, I think when, you know, our experience there, uh, perhaps speaks to this in, in that um, uh, people were, were very uh, uh, happy that we were interested in them and, and that we were, you know, taking a serious interest in their everyday lives. And I suppose that's because um, being a Cajun was not always, uh, you know, you weren't always top dog in that culture, as you just explained. You're, parents and grandparents, you know, you considered somewhat second-class citizens for a while. And, uh, but we, but we didn't really, we were oblivious to that. We saw what we saw and we, um, we were astonished by it and we thought it was very valuable and, and uh, a wonderful life, lifestyle that people were living. So and, I think, not, and I'm thank you very much for speaking up because um, uh, one of the uh, we very much would like to have uh, people from the Cajun parishes see the exhibition uh, and we would like to be able to talk with them just like this actually that that's that would be the most valuable experience for us to use the work as a jumping off point to discuss you know, how it affects you being a Cajun. It's, it's beautiful and it, it is, um, it's so nice to see the beauty uh, represented that someone sees it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Charles. No, no, I'm, I'm done, I was done. All right, um, and, and I think the same is true of the oil industry when talking about, yes, there's money and there's uh, an ability to stay, but also, you know, roughnecking is, a, is rough. Yeah. Right. And um, so, so thank you for that. One thing I, I just want to expound upon a little bit. I think we were probably so well embraced all the time because maybe this idea of Cajun pride, maybe which when it freezes, I think I can still was move. coming to the fore at that period. Uh, it, oh. You're here to photograph us because we are Cajun, because we're proud of being Cajun. I think they didn't said that, say that. That may have been a factor in, in, in us being able to move so readily throughout the culture at the time. And I have come to another way of framing this for artists and photographers. For a while, there's been this taboo about going into someone else's culture and certainly what they call parachute photography, where you drop in and photograph and then leave, it has a real stigma to it and should have. But we, we were there for six months. We, we, we got to know people, we were involved. And I think at this moment in history, it may be quite important for us to look at something outside of our bubble, outside of our family, outside of our customary route. And to, you know, to dive in to, uh, another culture, another sect, another whatever, uh, and just take a good look, uh, even if we don't photograph, uh, because maybe we don't really understand the other because we haven't bothered to find out. And we certainly found out about this particular uh, culture that way. And I don't, I think it's a good thing to do. Uh, there will be your people pictures who- speak um in a kind way do yeah, you anybody with good intentions. photographs can see that you didn't go as a voyeur to get a story 
you went to discover who these people are and you can thank see you. it in the photographs. So thank you for that. Thank you. There's a can, lot I, can I just highly recommend that since most of us will never get to the exhibition, um, the book is magnificent and you'll love it. So do what you can to get a copy. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? By the way, I think it's, uh, I think there is actually, there's some very uh, charming footage of Nathan Abshire at his job. I think it's in a less blank film, but I'm not, I'm not sure I saw it recently. Someone interviews him at the dump. Less blank film. It's worth, it's worth finding. Are you going to do this again, this Zoom thing, another? And I, I asked that because um, I spend time, a lot of time with Cajun musicians, at least I did until recently. Um, and it would be nice to get a few people from that culture who know some of that history to join in. Um, you know, you're, and if I know, you're right. if you I would... know you're, oh, I'm sorry, if I know you're doing it, I would try and make some contacts for you. Mm -hmm. We'd be happy to do it if you make the contact or anybody makes the contact to put on whatever talk or exposition of, of this work we can do online. And, uh, you know, we were, um, and, and this is being recorded, by the way. So <laughs> it is available and we, we will post how, how to get it. Hopefully we post it right. I apologize to anybody who couldn't get in. I have no idea why this happened. We were, uh, we were lucky, we were fortunate uh, to be able to, to have been interviewed uh, this week by uh, Judith Merriweather uh, uh, from uh, the Lafayette uh, NPR station, KR, KRVS, or is that what it is? Something like that. Yes, right. And, and I was very happy about that because I know that that reach, that that is, you know, it's based in Lafayette and it broadcasts to the Cajun community. And as I said, it's the Cajun community that we're really most interested in reaching. Oh, and I, I see you have our, uh, our, the original April announcement of the show on your refrigerator. <laughs> Barry Kay, will you send us your email? We'll send you the li more links to send to people. Oh, okay. Send us your email through, in the chat. Yeah, I can. Well, I don't know how to do it there, but yeah. I'll, I'll contact Doug because I. Okay, good. Thank you. A mutual yeah. friend. Uh, oh. Also, just on getting into this, I tried to get in just going in through Zoom. That didn't work. It took me to some other meeting that was going to happen in a couple of weeks. But I went in through, then I found in, in the link that uh, Joe had sent me, I found a direct link on to come in right through the web page. And that worked. That got me here. Thank you. I'm sorry. I don't know why that didn't work. I don't either. But I just thought you should, you know, I could tell you at least that's what happened to me. Thank you. That's helpful. Any other questions? Uh, just a comment. I was thinking, you know, we focused on the Cajuns in the 70s, but... Did you speak up? I don't know who's talking. Uh, uh, Richard. Hi, Richard. Hey, Charlie. Um, we've been focusing on the 70s, but what it also reminded me of was uh, the current contemporary discussions in New York City about how we're going to prevent our, our next, you know, inundations and the offshore islands and the wetlands that we've destroyed. And uh, the debate about how, you know, I'm sure it's also a debate shared in other cities about how we're going to offset that. So it really well, that's really, that's really why we wanted to do this particular program. Because, you know, once, once our photographs, so once the, the show was mounted and uh, we were able to step back and kind of, and look at it for a while, uh, all of a sudden, storm after storm after storm came, and uh, we realized that, you know, the, the current administration has sucked all of the oxygen out of the room, and 
uh, we barely, you know, you would hear on the news, oh, a major a hurricane just just hit Lake Charles and devastated my area, you know, the entire area. And then it was gone. And, uh, the, and thank God this incoming administration is going to be positive about climate change. You know, it's the only thing, it's the only thing we can hope for, really. Well, everybody. Hey, I'd like to say uh, something just to Charles Traub. Yes. Please, this is Brenda Hannigan. I worked with you uh, for a couple of years at SBA in the late 90s. Sure, Brenda. I grew up in Baton Rouge, and you told me uh, about this this uh, series of uh, docu uh, photographs that you had taken in the 70s, and we had several conversations about it. And I, I find myself back in Louisiana living in New Orleans, and I was so excited to, to hear about uh, this coming to the uh, this Burton New Orleans collection, and um, it's so wonderful to finally see it in fruition, even if it's online. And um, I hope to get the book, and it's uh, great to see it. So, well, you can go see the show if you haven't. Well, yeah, yeah, I plan on it. I think <laughs> it, but it was opening. I think something happened. You were going to be there, or there was going to be a talk in person, and I don't know if that was. Oh, the that was back in April. <laughs> oh yeah, so it was probably a shutdown, or and then since then it's just been. Hurricane of the Month Club down here, you know, so it's uh, so much going on. But anyway, it's been wonderful, and uh, thank you. I'm so glad I finally get to see it all, so thanks. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're very thank grateful. Thank you all for sharing. It's a great idea. Thank sharing. you, everybody, friends and new friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.